Thank you. Um, thanks so much for organizing this workshop. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen. I hope my connection holds up because sometimes I have issues, but I think it, it's going to work. Um, it was fairly reliable the last two days. Um, yeah, I'm talking about um, stuff that's based on two papers I've written, and hopefully uh, there will be more papers coming out of this. Uh, currently, I'm trying to figure out a way uh, to write about emotional marginalization in general, so trying to define what emotional marginalization is. Um, but I really like this opportunity to talk about how the stuff I've already written on pathologizing trans identities um, also connects to mental health and questions regarding mental health. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just talking or pointing to ways in which I think trans identities are pathologized um, still today, even though uh, it's 2023 um, <clears throat> and the ways um, and without really arguing for that, but just something that's just going to be something I'm assuming and something I'm working with. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, and the next thing I'm going to do is uh, going to uh, say what, mar what, what marginalization is and what it has been argued to be and apply that to emotion and say why I think it's important to, to try and apply that to emotion. Um, and then um, after looking at what I think emotional marginalization in general is, I'll look at a couple of examples. So at the end, the talk is gonna be more practice-based and, and I'm gonna provide a couple of examples that I think are uh, not specific to only trans identities, but, but are specific trans examples or, or examples of trans identities being emotionally marginalized. And I'm very happy to discuss both theory and, and more of these practice-based example with you in the Q&A. Um, okay, I'm trying, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, I think uh, one thing I find really interesting about the pathologization of trans identities is that there is um, a new ICD version, so the, the, a new version of the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. Um, so there is a new version of the official pathologization book, so to say. Um, and that is supposed to be the first version that provides a fairly depathologized account of transness. Uh, so in that version of the ICD, in the ICD-11, transness is no longer classified as a disorder. It is still um, sort of, it's still sort of a course in the ICD-11. Uh, the justification for that being that there needs to be a way uh, uh, for also for trans people to access healthcare. Um, that's often used as a as a justification for um, for um, listing it at all. Uh, but it's not less listed as a disorder anymore, uh, but as um, I think a new version of gender incongruence or something like that. Uh, the issue is here that the ICD uh, still remains authoritative. Uh, so the ICD-11, as far as I know, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I know, it's not yet legally binding. You can use it if you're a pr practitioner, um, but in Germany, it's definitely not legally binding, for example, to use it yet. So you can still rely on the ICD-10 version. Uh, and even if so, uh, even if uh, the ICD-11 would already be legally binding in place, I think uh, there's still a lot of room to say that trans identities have been pathologized for such a long history, uh, especially in 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 the ICD, um, uh, that the pathologization is not going to be removed once a new ICD comes in place that provides a more deep pathologized understanding. So, in all of the older ICDs and in the ICD ten that's still used nowadays, uh, trans identities are are um, framed as. Um, or transness is framed as a disorder and, and is referred to by the term transsexualism and yeah, is framed as a gender identity disorder. So I think here we can, it's pretty obvious that transness is pathologized via mental health classifications uh, or alongside with them. Yeah, um, what do I think, uh, what does that have to do with emotion? Uh, one interesting parallel I think there is, is that both gender and emotion tend to be declared natural phenomena rather than social cultural products. When I say that, that's a bit of a, an oversimplification, uh, because now, especially when we look at the philosophy of emotion and also the philosophy of gender, there's much more variety of accounts um, that, that are coming up and that are being um, produced. Uh, but in the, when we look at the history of 
for example, uh, theories of emotion, uh, we can see that there used to be at least a phase in which there was a lot of naturalization of emotions going on. And uh, also, even if uh, in the philosophy of emotion, we can notice a trend that uh, incorporates more um, focus on social cultural practices or, or, or on emotions as social cultural products, we can still see uh, how so a sort of naturalized understanding of emotion is being used in uh, psychology in AI. There's a lot of applied cases where we can uh, where we can see uh, how a naturalized understanding of emotion is is being applied. Um, so when you think of emotion recognition, for example, of emotion rec uh, AI emotion recognition, um, they use a very universal understanding of emotion and an understanding of emotion that's sort of innate or or presupposes an in innateness. Um, yeah, uh, there's also a couple of theories who have pointed to this, as I already said, in the philosophy of emotions or the impact of social factors on emotion has often been neglected. I think with uh, gender, we see that uh, right now, uh, mostly in perhaps populist debates about gender, that there's always going to be somebody in the comment section who says something like, you can't change gender, it's just the way it is. Um, Obviously, in English language, you have different terms, so you both have gender and sex, but I think very often people still use uh, the, the claim that you can't change gender even, uh, it's not just about sex. And interestingly, in German, for example, you don't have these different concepts to uh, talk about gender or sex, it's, it's, it's one word. Um, so yeah, so I think norms around emotion uh, uh, haven't been acknowledged or are not acknowledged. Um, in the ways we also practice them. Um, because obviously the way uh, theory of emotion is done and the way uh, science um, looks at emotion will also have an impact on how society looks at emotion. Um, so here we could, we could make the claim that trans and gender variant people may fail to comply with or seemingly fail to comply with dominant emotion norms. Um, what that means we'll look at later um, in more detail, uh, but I think this, uh, this may constitute a marginalization of emotion in the specific case of, of trans identities. Um, why do I even look at emotional marginalization? Uh, I think, uh, or also emotional injustice. In another paper, I talk about emotional injustice. So to me, the difference is not quite clear either yet. Uh, but I think there's also um, there's also empirical studies, and especially in psychology, that look at um, differences in emotion recognition that I think are not just um, neutral differences, but I, that I think have a larger societal impact or also a social meaning. Um, so uh, one example is uh, research that looks at the resting bitch face. Uh, so when women's neutral faces are perceived as angry. Um, and also uh, another example that has been looked at in, in empirical research is when white people ascribe anger to black people, even though there's no experience of anger there. So these are just two examples of empirical research that sort of motivated me to look at if there is something or, or if there are emotion experiences that could be framed as emotional marginalization uh, or a specific phenomena that describes some emotion experiences that could be framed as marginalization. Um, and now for a better understanding of what emotional marginalization is, I think obviously we need to understand what marginalization is or at least acknowledge that there has been research done on what marginalization in general is. Uh, so the more original texts that are concerned with, with marginalization, I think the first one was in 1928 or something, uh, and they didn't talk about marginalization, but about marginalizing or, or some term that's sort of related, but not quite the phenomenon. Uh, but anyways, so the, the original understanding of marginalization was to be forced to be in the peripheries of society. Um, and it typically meant something like limit, having limited access and opportunities to political, social, and economic goods. So it was usually related um, also as Iris Marin Young uh, pointed out uh, to uh, a, a kind of exclusion from the workforce. For, uh, so you're not really a functional member of society uh, or you're not an economically um, useful member of society. That was the original understanding of marginalization. Uh, but that understanding has been uh, opened up and has been broadened. Uh, so Fricker and Bilson both apply marginalization to uh, to understand marginalization as an exclusion from practices rather than just uh, an exclusion from, from being a functional citizen or, or the workforce and so, or something like that. Um, 
And Bilson, for example, also argues that there are different kinds of marginalization, some of which are concerned with cultural processes or social roles or social structures. So the understanding has been broadened. Uh, and now I think marginalization can be applied to emotion, but it's not perhaps not ultimately clear how it can be applied to emotion or how we can use this concept to look at emotion. And I think one way that might uh, make it easier for us to understand um, what's going on in emotion is uh, to look at emotion as emotion practices or to look at the way in which we practice emotion rather than looking at emotion as something that's happening to us and that we are the victims of and that we can't really influence or that society doesn't have an influence on. Uh, so here uh, you see examples of some of my friends and people I know performing very the typical six basic emotions that have been uh, presupposed by a couple of emotion researchers um, just to just to uh, say something like, oh, maybe we can actually perform that and maybe it's not something that is naturally given and maybe it's not something that's ultimately happening uh, once we feel a specific emotion, but emotion is also something we do and we practice, including and it includes uh, the way we um, uh, express emotion and the way we perform emotion perhaps with our whole body. Uh, so to me, um, uh, emotional expressions are integral to uh, emotion and not uh, an external part. Um, I think, uh, and I think understanding emotion in that way uh, may help us to look at how uh, there might be something like emotional marginalization or injustice. Um, there is also some more explicit work on that. So um, there is work on effective injustice that's slowly coming up uh, in the last couple of years, uh, but there's not so much talk on uh, about emotional marginalization. But somebody uh, uh, named Charlie Kerf talked about uh, emotional marginalization and said, um, well, there seem to be norms that disproportionately affect members of marginalized group groups and thereby contribute to their further marginalization. And Kurf is a philosopher of emotion, so he specifically talks about emotion in that um, context. Uh, so how do I think can marginalization apply to emotion? I think we can think or speak of limited access to emotion practices on the level of emotional expression, on the level of emotion recognition, and perhaps also on the level of emotional experience. Uh, that seems to be the point that is uh, the least likely to be um, the least, yeah, that, that people seem to question most. Uh, but yeah, we'll look at that in detail later and perhaps it will become more clear what I mean by that. Um, there is also some work by Misha Cherry that we draw on in our co-authored paper with, uh, in my co-authored paper with Pismani and Prince on emotional injustice, uh, where we talk about what is emotional injustice and we draw on Cherry and Cherry um, differentiates different stages at which emotions might be subject to external regulation. Um, external regulation, um, meaning uh, there is something that regulates uh, the way you experience, express, or recognize emotion, but it doesn't need to be something that's um, that's um, directly present, but it can also be a, a longer uh, societal influence. Uh, and Jerry says, well, uh, there seem to be different levels, so there seems to be a level of elic elicitation, so an emotion can occur, and the way it occurs, um, or the elicitation itself is uh, maybe influenced um, and maybe a, a level, maybe an instance uh, of emotional marginalization, uh, and also the way in which emotions are perceived by others, and and uh, the way in which we ascribe an emotion to somebody else after perceiving uh, their expression and after interpreting the, that expression may also be an instance of marginalization, uh, as well as the uptake of emotion. So. Uh, the way we interact with the, the emotion we experience or we think we experience may also be an instance of emotional marginalization. So there are different levels at which <clears throat> emotional marginalization occurs. Um, well, now there's the big question, why does emotional marginalization occur? I think that's actually the stuff for multiple papers that I can't really sufficiently cover here. Uh, so I'm just going to make a very general point and refer to my colleague Im Imke von Mauer, who talks about emotion repertoires. Um, and, and Imke argues that there's a deep inculcation of norms around emotions. So social norms influence which behaviors we incorporate into our repertoire in the first place, and thereby also enable um, the stuff we're able to experience or the specific emotions we're able to experience. Um, yeah, this is just to sum up uh, or to sort of bring off all of that stuff together uh, and provide a, a little bit of a summary of what emotional marginalization is. Um, 
So, and on what levels it can take place. Uh, so I talked about elicitation or emotion experience. So we may be unable to describe or access our own emotion experience in accordance with the given norm or a negative emotion may be elicited due to a discriminatory situation. Um, there is also the level of emotional display. So our emotional display may be different from peers due to specific norms, expectations, internalized roles. And we may not display emotions in accordance with what is typically defined as emotion display for emotion X. Uh, so I think there are um, also, as I said, in emotion theory, there are specific norms that are present in, in how we categorize emotion, how we associate which expression which with specific emotion. Um, so I'm talking about this on a pretty general level now, but I think this can be applied then to specific groups in particular. Um, and that's going to be um, become obvious in, in a second, hopefully. Um, and then there's also the level of emotion recognition. Uh, so our recognition may be inhibited or filtered through our marginalization status or our experiences associated, associated with that. Um, and our uh, display or performance, perhaps our facial expressions or the way our uh, the way we use our bodies to to express uh, specific emotions may be rated as too intense, as a, a wrong emotion may be attributed, um, or an emotion display may not be recognized as an emotion display at all. Okay, now let me go over to the examples. Um, one pretty, I think, obvious and, and sort of general example um, where we can see some specifics for trans people. Uh, is that uh, there may be a lack of scripts or concepts to communicate emotions. And we know this um, uh, through uh, the literature on epistemic injustice, uh, and I'm just going to apply that to emotion here. Uh, so there may be a lack of scripts or concepts to communicate or categorize the, 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 the feelings we're having. Uh, in the case of trans people, there may be someone without the concept of gender dysphoria because you haven't encountered it before for whatever reason. Uh, and, and that someone may be slow to recognize an underlying dissatisfaction with their assigned gender or sex, that can have implications on how this person interprets their own uh, feelings and emotions. Um, that can also have an effect, I think we'll see that in a minute, on mental health contexts where they're not properly able to categorize um, their, yeah, categorize their emotions in the first place. And then perhaps a situation gets created where that results in a misdiagnosis or something like that. So I think this may have impacts on mental uh, an impact on mental health context. Uh, context. Um, then also gender norms contribute to the way emotions are communicated. Uh, and in the in the case of trans people, um, there's uh, yeah we have to take into account that there is a disconnect between the gender we were assigned and the gender um, we are. Uh, so uh, there's perhaps also a disconnect um, between the, the emotional expectations we're confronted with and the emotions we actually want to perform. Whether that's a good thing or not is, is, uh, is another question, right? But uh, perhaps in order to conform to certain social norms or in order to be recognized as a specific gender, we, we may want to conform to specific norms and that includes norms around emotions and includes specifically gendered norms around emotions or how emotions are performed and which emotions specifically um, should be performed. So there's also, um, uh, there's also potential for uh, emotional marginalization on the level of uh, emotion communication. Um, now there's uh, also the example uh, I've written on this uh, of limited access to specific emotions. And I think specific emotions are one of the things that is um, mostly studied so far, uh, studied so far in affective injustice and the literature on affective injustice. So we have a lot of stuff on anger, for example. And one thing I looked at is love. Um, and um, when we think of trans people, um, we can think of how, um, how, how uh, societal aspects contribute um, to uh, rendering somebody lovable in society's eyes. Um, there is also a study, so this is just a relying on social constructionist understandings of love, uh, but perhaps we don't even need to rely on that uh, to, to see that um, there seems to be uh, also a movement going on that's not uh, that doesn't render trans people lovable uh, and thereby creates a limited access for trans people to love. Um, there's also um, a study I cite that actually where actually people uh, 
yeah, cis people say that they do can't imagine themselves dating a trans person. So there seems to be data, even though it's not a lot, that supports a, a claim that says trans people have limited access to specific emotions and, and here, uh, for example, to the emotion love. Um, then there's also the issue uh, in love, especially because it's such an interpersonal thing um, uh, of not being seen for who one is, but perhaps as an object of one's being trans, so as an object of fetishization, or as just as something other, or um, also the issue of not being recognized as the gender uh, one is. <clears throat> um, now, perhaps a pretty obvious example, because it's also all over social media, and we all perhaps have some point of connection with that. Um, um, emotional labor, I think, is a good example for emotional marginalization. Uh, not in all cases, but in some cases, and uh, some of the cases may be um, or result, I should say, result in emotional marginalization. Uh, and some of the cases for trans people specifically may be um, the emotional cost of misgendering uh, or uh, you know, labor of explaining somebody that this is wrong or that that's not the right way to address um, you or, or somebody else. And then also unwanted attention and invasive question. Uh, Perry Cern has written a bit about this. Um, and Perry has also looked at curiosity. Uh, so he does distinguish between cases where um, yeah, curiosity doesn't necessarily create a problem and, and where it perhaps does. Uh, or where it is more uh, something like unwanted attention and, and where, where it's something like invasive. Um, and also uh, the emotional cost of demanding explanations for your own um, um, presentation or your own behavior or your own identify, uh, yeah, identity, basically. Um, now, more explicitly uh, related to mental health context, although I think all of these other examples do relate to mental health context uh, in a more indirect way, perhaps. Um, uh, is um, the example of emotion misrecognition in mental health context. So uh, there is work that looks into how marginalized people are more likely to be misdiagnosed in medical or psychiatric context. And I think that also has implications or has to do with, with how emotions are communicated and how emotions are perceived perhaps in that context. Um, I think here we can we can say that emotions are perhaps distorted by being viewed through a medical lens or by being regarded as symptoms of transness. I think there's also memes online doesn't necessarily relate to only mental health context, but to medical context. There's you can also see memes where trans people um, uh, talk about their experiences of of going to a doctor or to a psychiatrist. Uh, or of going to a doctor with you know a, a pain in their leg or something, and the psychiatrist the doctor will ask. Um, are you sure uh, that's because of your accident or something else? Or you, you, do you think that could be related to uh, you taking uh, testosterone or uh, estrogen or something like that? Or even, not even to hormones, but just to somebody's um, gender dysphoria or somebody's being trans. Uh, so there's all kinds of obscure examples of that um, where we can see that emotions are being distorted or also uh, feelings such as pains, uh, pain uh, are being distorted by being viewed through uh, this uh, medical lens. Uh, and then there's also the issue, uh, I think, which is perhaps the most explicit examples, example for um, this context, um, the issue of misdiagnosis, um, so gender dysphoria, for example, may not be recognized due to either a so-called comorbidities or uh, a wrong diagnosis, uh, and uh, trans people are also often uh, required to hold back, uh, so I think um, uh, hold, holding back uh, in the sense of uh, not talking about all the other stuff that may be going on in terms of mental health because they want to have their diagnosis of transness. Uh, it depends a bit on the country, uh, but here in Germany, for example, you are requ required still to uh, have a certain amount of therapy done before um, being able to access uh, hormones and surgery. And you, you, you are also required to have a therapist letter for uh, accessing hormones. So, and in that setting, uh, a lot of trans people will only go to therapy because uh, they, they need access to hormones. Uh, and then we'll obviously not talk about depression or something else, else that may be going on because they just want this letter. Um, yeah, one more explicit example, I think that's my last slide, yes. <laughs> one more explicit example uh, is uh, transmedicalism, uh, which roughly means something like uh, saying uh, only those people are trans who uh, pursue medical transition and also uh, one more condition 
in some context seems to be uh, that prior to this medical transition, you you're sort of you need to be miserable, so you you're not supposed to feel happy with the your your body basically. Um, so there is a presumptive unhappiness prior to medical transition that gets assumed. Um, that obviously can have influence uh, uh, impact on mental health context depending on who gets uh, confronted with those views and who doesn't and and um, and uh, transmedicalism is also present in some trans communities so it's not a view that is completely outside of trans communities but it's also located within uh, our own communities um, so that may have an impact on mental health context and how diagnosis also plays out or how yeah whether there is a misdiagnosis happening or not um, uh, and we also see that in uh, how in some countries suffering is is required by health insurances in some countries to order uh, the the cover uh, to cover the costs for medical transition. Um, so it's not only that you have to go to a therapist and talk to them and be like, "Hey, I'm trans. Could you be, please give me a letter?" But some therapists will still practice. Um, yeah, basically making you perform some kind of suffering. Uh, uh, obviously not explicitly, but it's implicitly expected uh, of you. So you sort of, yeah, uh, obey to that and just perform the suffering in order to get what you want. Um, I think, yeah, all of these examples, I don't have a conclusion slide uh, because I wanted to finish with these more practice-based examples um, that we have something more, um, yeah, practice-based also to talk about. Um, but I think all of these examples show different ways in which emotional marginalization may take place, um, and also especially uh, in which emotional marginalization may also have um, uh, consequences for mental health contexts, or also may take place within mental health contexts or because of mental health contexts. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say for now, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A.